Hi everyone, and welcome to Nansek's tutorial on epilepsy and seizures. Today we will be covering some key definitions, seizure classifications, and lastly, epilepsy. So, firstly, let's talk about seizures. There are some key definitions that you should know to make sure that we're all on the same page. A seizure is the consequence of a paroxysmal uncontrolled discharge of neurons within the CNS. The clinical manifestation ranges from a major motor convulsion to a brief period of lack of awareness. A seizure can also be described as the ictus. The prodrome refers to the mood or behavioural changes that occur before a seizure. An aura refers to the symptom immediately before the seizure and it helps localise the point of origin of the seizure in the nervous system. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Lastly, the postictal period refers to the time immediately after the ictus during which the patient may be confused, disoriented, and demonstrate automatic behaviours. Next, we're going to talk about the classification of seizures. This is often something that students find challenging, so I've tried to break it down for you. Seizures can be characterised as being partial or generalised. So let's talk about partial seizures first. These are seizures that originate from one specific location in the brain and have varying severities. With regards to location, they are often described depending on which lobe they originate from. Frontal lobe seizures can be characterised by the Jacksonian march. This is a march of involuntary movement from one muscle group to the next in a limb, often seen as moving up the arm, for example. Parietal lobe seizures arise in the sensory cortex, with the patient describing paresthesia or tingling in an extremity or on the face. Temporal seizures are characterised by a complex aura with four key disturbances. First, a visceral disturbance, such as gustatory or olfactory hallucinations, lip smacking, choking, sensation or nausea. Secondly, a memory disturbance, such as déjà vu, jamais vu, depersonalisation or derealisation. Thirdly, a motor disturbance, such as rubbing or chewing. And lastly, an affective disturbance such as feeling pleasure, depression or fear. Occipital lobe seizures are very uncommon and present with a visual hallucination prior to the seizure. With regards to severities, partial seizures come in two types. Simple is when consciousness is preserved and complex is when consciousness is impaired. Next, let's talk about generalised seizures. So these arise from subcortical structures and impair both hemispheres. There are five types. Absent seizures are when the patient stares vacantly and is almost switched off to the environment around them. Myoclonic seizures are sudden, brief, generalised muscle contractions. Tonic seizures are sudden, sustained muscular contraction. Atonic seizures are very rare and, have, and are characterised by a loss of muscle tone and a sudden fall. They often accompany other types of generalised seizure. Lastly, the tonic-clonic seizure, which is the most commonly heard of amongst medical students, and is a combination of a tonic phase followed by a clonic phase. One thing to bear in mind is that a partial seizure can also develop into a tonic-clonic seizure. The seizure originates in one lobe, transmits to subcortical structures, which then release a further discharge that spreads back to the cerebral cortex on both hemispheres. This results in your tonic-clonic seizure. It's often difficult to tell seizures apart from pseudo seizures and syncope. This grid gives a few pointers towards these differences to help you in your clinical practice. First, seizures rarely have a trigger unless they are caused by something like light, whereas syncope often has a trigger such as blood or being stood upright. Pseudo seizures can also have a trigger such as stress. All three tend to have a prodrome. In seizures, this is very brief whilst in pseudo seizures this is prolonged. As most of you who have suffered from syncope will know, this is often preceded by a feeling of nausea and sweatiness. The duration also varies between the three, with seizures lasting between two to five minutes, syncope between 30 seconds to two minutes, and pseudo seizures anywhere between one hour, sorry, one minute and an hour. Jerking is common in all three, but it is short-lived in syncope and in pseudo seizures may be prolonged, erratic and variable. Eyes may be open in both seizures and syncope, but are often shut and resist external opening in pseudo seizures. 
The colour of the patient also varies during these attacks, with the patient being pale during a partial seizure or red-blue in a tonic-clonic seizure. They're usually very pale in syncope, and, but in pseudo-seizures are normal or can be slightly blue. The patient's breathing also varies. Both seizures and syncope may show apnea and expiration, while pseudo-seizures have abnormal breathing patterns such as hyperventilation, coughing or apnea and inspiration. Incontinence is common in a seizure but not the other two. Injury is also common in a seizure and is often severe, whilst it is uncommon in syncope and trivial in pseudo-seizures. Within this, tongue biting in seizures tends to occur on the sides of the tongue, whilst in pseudo-seizures it occurs on the tip of the tongue, on the cheek or on the lip. Lastly, the period after a seizure, the postictal period, the patient is often confused for a while, whilst in the other two conditions there is often rapid recovery and patients are oriented very quickly. Within the topic of seizures is epilepsy. This is the propensity to have recurrent unprovoked seizures and can be caused by discernible brain pathology, or it can be elusive, in which case it's called idiopathic epilepsy. Causes of epilepsy include trauma, infections such as meningitis, infarcts or hemorrhages, drugs and brain tumours. There are some key epilepsy syndromes that you often have to distinguish in MCQ exams. I will cover each of these briefly to help you understand the differences between them. First is West syndrome. This tends to start around four to six months and is characterised by violent spasms of the head, trunk and limbs, followed by the extension of the arms. These can also be called salam spasms. On EEG, characteristic hypsarrhythmias is seen, which is a chaotic pattern of high voltage slow waves and multifocal sharp wave discharges. The treatment for West syndrome is vigabatrin. The onset of lennox gaustat is slightly later, around one to three years old. It is mostly characterized by drop attacks, tonic seizures and atypical absences. It's also associated with learning difficulties and neuropsychiatric disturbances. Prognosis tends to be quite poor. When ch kids are slightly older, around four to 12 years, the onset of childhood absence epilepsy starts. This epilepsy is characterized by the child staring momentarily and stopping all movement, apart from the occasional twitching of eyelids or movement of hands. This only lasts a few seconds before they recover. The child has no recollection of what they missed, but they do realise that they've missed something. The majority are female and this condition has a good prognosis. In adolescence, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy becomes more prominent. A typical history is of throwing drinks or cornflakes in the morning, as it is mostly myoclonic seizures that occur soon after waking. It has a characteristic EEG and treatment is good but lifelong. The last significant clinical epilepsy syndrome is Sturge-Weber. This is associated with a facial lesion, a port wine stain, in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve, as you can see in the photo. For children less severely affected, deterioration rarely occurs beyond five years of age. The next section is all about investigations in epilepsy. These are carried out for four main reasons. First, to corroborate the diagnosis of epilepsy. Second, to classify the type of epilepsy. Third, to look for an underlying cause. And lastly, to eliminate alternative diagnoses. The gold standard investigations include neuroimaging, to rule out lesions such as brain tumours. An EEG can also be helpful to support a diagnosis and determine which epilepsy syndrome is concerned. Lastly, cardiac arrhythmias like long QT syndrome need to be ruled out, so an ECG is always in mandatory investigations. Additional investigations to consider include appropriate blood tests for looking for alternative causes such as glucose, electrolytes, calcium and blood cultures. Medication-wise, a variety of anti-epileptics can be used and they each come with their own side effect profile. In generalised seizures, first-line treatment includes sodium valparate. However, if the patient is of childbearing age, you should not prescribe sodium valparate as it has teratogenic effects. Therefore, other first-line medications include lamotrigine for tonic-clonic, tonic and atonic seizures, ethosuximide for absent seizures, and levetiracetam for myoclonic seizures. 
For focal seizures, first line management is lamotrigine or carbamazepine, and second line is levetiracetam, oxcarbazepine, or sodium valparate. One key thing to think about with epilepsy is a person's ability to drive. When off treatment, if a person has one seizure, they have to have one year off driving to make sure it doesn't happen again. The DVLA will consider reducing this to six months if their MRI and EEG are normal. If the patient has epilepsy and is on medication, they must first be free of attacks for one year before they can drive. If they are slowly reducing their medication, they must have six months symptom free whilst not on any anti-epileptics until they can drive. The last section is about status epilepticus. This is when either a single epileptic seizure lasts for more than five minutes or two or more seizures occur within a five minute period without the person recovering consciousness between them. Initial general management includes the normal A to E with preservation of an airway, oxygen administration and baseline vitals. If a reversible cause is found, such as low blood sugars, reverse this. Once this has been confirmed, a benzodiazepine is given, usually 10 milligrams of midazolam buccally. If the patient is already on antiepileptics, you should check whether or not these have already been given, as they are the most likely medication to stop the seizure. If after waiting 10 minutes, the seizure continues, you can repeat midazolam or give another benzodiazepine, such as four milligrams lorazepam IV. 10 minutes after this, the patient is officially in established status and needs to be given phenytoin. If this still does not work, the patient is in refractory status and should be given propofol, transferred to ICU for intubation and monitored continuously, including an EEG. That concludes this session. I hope you found it helpful and there's a matching worksheet to provide you with written prompts for what I've just talked about. Good luck with your exams.